A warm welcome to our forum, and thank, and thank you for joining this session today. My name is Elizabeth Sackville, and I'm part of the Women's Forum editorial team. In a moment, I'll hand you over to our moderator, Marie-Aline Nelly, who will be leading this highly interactive session where you will hear from Women's Forum rising talents, youth leaders, and other leaders from a variety of sectors and generations as they focus on what is needed to create the conditions for leaders from all generations to drive an inclusive recovery. To follow and engage with the session on social media, please use the hashtags, hashtag woman for inclusion, hashtag WFGM20. Now, before I hand over to Marie-Aline, I would like to ask two important leaders to set the scene for our conversation today. I'd like to welcome Isabel Schwal, Managing Director of Lazard, and Angeles garcia Poveda, Chairwoman of the Board of Le Grand and Director of Spencer Stewart. Isabel, Angeles, over to you to set the scene. Thank you for that introduction. What, what a joy and uh, an honor to be spending time with all of you at the Women's Forum, and in particular, to be introducing this very session with my friend Isabel, uh, a session celebrating the Rising Talents Initiative, which is so close to, to my heart. Boy, this has been a really tough year for all of us, personally and professionally, and it's still. Um, and therefore, the opportunity to get together and to connect with each other, to give and receive energy, even virtually, is, is a real privilege. And, and spending time with the female leaders of the future uh, is something that gives me a, a real kick. Um, if you think of, of our world, we, we live a moment of unprecedented crisis, sanitary, economic, social, political, environmental, and although none of these events are completely new, what is new is the concurrence of all of them in time and space and at a global scale. And even our supposedly more advanced social and economical systems are showing the limits, which creates even bigger gaps with less privileged parts of the world and within members of the same society. The level of uncertainty about the future remains really strong, despite the very positive news of, of last week. And in such contexts, it's very difficult to imagine to go back to our previous lives as they were. We will need to reinvent or invent new solutions and, and challenge the, the status quo. And in that context, no, nobody can claim to have all the answers. So the need of fundamental diversity of thought is stronger than ever if we want to tackle some of these issues in a, in a durable way. And embracing diversity on all its forms is key, not only because it's nice and fun and fair, but because it simply leads to better outcomes, because it leverages collective intelligence and allows us to learn from each other. So combining skills, backgrounds, cultures, different generations, business ecosystems with other disciplines, public and private initiatives, as the old African proverb says, it, it takes a village, right? This is the Women's Forum. So a quick word on gender diversity. Women have an incredible part to play. For those who are already in leadership or in, in uh, visible roles in business, medicine, politics, arts, education, research, you are obliged to deliver up to your dreams and to take others with you, to invite the new generations into your reflections, to be exemplary in terms of values, coherence and courage. And for those who are starting the journey or still rising, you are also obliged to fight for your convictions, to challenge your beliefs, to show resilience, to dare. We've had amazing examples of women leaders standing out in this crisis, leading with head, heart, courage, values, putting common interests before theirs, listening to the next gen's aspirations and leading with, with and through purpose. This new promotion of rising talents is one more step in the right direction of giving space and voice to great female leaders. And we are incredibly excited to welcome them and to listen to them today around this table. Aren't we, Isabel? We are definitely, Angeles, and thank you for this introduction. I mean, you know that it's a very um, dear program for us at Lazard and for you and doing it jointly with you. I mean, those leaders are, you know, embraces and embodies all the values that we stand for, you know, being excellent, engaged and empowered. I mean, they are excellent in their strong foundations, even though they are really young, some are still studying, 
they are expanding their skill sets and some are really already established and they want to, you know, to share their voice with the world. Um, they come from very diverse um, universes, uh, come different geographies, as you said, different, you know, um, uh, enterprises, large corporations, smaller ones, startups, you know, even think tanks. And so, you know, they really embody excellence and I think they can make an impact. And that's, you know, leads to the second point, which is really important. They are engaged. You know, they are excellent, but they want to change the world. Uh, they are in pursuit of, you know, a, a larger purpose in whatever fields they are operating at the moment. Uh, they are actually a change agent now. They are not only calling for actions, even though they may be young, they are actually making change. They are challenging decision makers. They are challenging, you know, male environments. They are making, you know, financial independence. And uh, for some, uh, you know, some female, they are willing to change education. They are willing to get change healthcare to make it a right to go into blind spots, uh, into new uh, areas where there is no interest at the moment. And uh, of course, you know, they are important in at tackling, you know, the climate change. You'll see in this promotion, you have a lot of ladies and female who are absolutely amazing. And we thought, you know, in selecting the promotion this year, in addition to have business backgrounds, scientists backgrounds, and you and and business and um, and engineers, um, we also brought, you know, some human humanities there. We have three researchers who are amazing, which you know forces us to not forget that to make an impact, we need to connect our body with our minds. And uh, we have this artist for peace who has some, you know, theater techniques and she will help, you know, the rising talent community and she will help this uh, promotion. We have a philosopher as well who works in ethics and reminds us that we need to shape, you know, this new digital world with the right values. And we have also Fatima Takebe, who's going to speak there, who helps us think and dream beyond our world, you know, being an astronaut and thinking, you know, beyond the planet. I'm sure all of them are going to inspire you as much as they've inspired us, um, because, you know, they are actually making the change now. And it's not a matter of age. It's not a matter of, you know, waiting to be senior enough. I think they're going to show you that, you know, three decades of generation in this uh, promotion for ranging from 22 to 40 years old, they are already having an impact. They have a huge sense of urgency. And I think this is important because, you know, they are also, you know, sending a hopeful message. And that's why we're very proud at Lazard with Spencer to promote and support those ladies because I'm sure we are giving them a larger voice and I think they're going to inspire us. And as they've inspired everybody, we hope you're going to enjoy, you know, the discussion today. Hear, hear. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Angeles. Thank you, Isabel, uh, for that poignant opening to set our session up today. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you into the capable hands of Marie-Aline, uh, our moderator for today. Um, Marjaline, over to you. Hi, Ella. Thank you for this wonderful energy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this debate. For half an hour, we are trying, we are going to try together. This is a huge challenge to find solutions to build a more inclusive world. After the pandemic, you know that the world will never be the same. The coronavirus crisis caused many changes and the urgent need to build back better and to reshape the world together. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity for us uh, to accelerate inclusive progress. How can we learn from, build on and imagine a more inclusive future? How can women leaders, managers from all generation, create the conditions to drive on inclusive recovery. You can ask us any question you want during this discussion, and uh, obviously our speakers uh, will answer. It's um, an honor for me to moderate this debate with uh, five amazing women. So, it's an honor for me to welcome Trudy Ravensbergen. Hi, Trudy. You can uh, 
put your microphone on, <laughs> partner at the Boost Factory, Elizabeth Eisel, welcome, founder and CEO of the Global Institute for Experience Entrepreneurship, Dorothy Rock, welcome, co-founder and director of Become Tech Rising Talent 2019, Evelina Vajesjoy, welcome, co-founder and CEO of Eli Pharmacy Rising Talent 2019, Fatuma Takebe, welcome, IAU Office for Astronomy Outreach and Rising Talent 2020. You all come from different fields and it is very interesting for us uh, from your point of view to understand how can women's leadership at all levels play a role in designing this inclusive world. Uh, first question, what have you learned from your experience uh, from the pandemic as a woman about your ability uh, to achieve a project? Who wants to start? Maybe Elizabeth. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I, of all people on the panel, represent the older generation and what older women bring to the decision-making process and what they bring through their experience and the experience that has gained wisdom and that they know what works and what doesn't work. So we can help younger women make some of these decisions much more expediently and much more sustainably. And what I have learned is that really this is an opportune time because we're all in crisis and people are much more willing to listen than ever before and even listen to women and women's opinion. And women have been thinking entrepreneurially all their lifetimes, whether they're just managing a home, a family or work or starting a new business. So we have a lot to contribute and we are extraordinarily eager to share it with all of you and with everyone at the forum today. Oh, that's a good start. Dorothy? Hello, everyone. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Um, what I've learned from this, uh, this crisis personally um, is maybe that the, the future is full of surprises. No? Yeah. Uh, what seemed impossible, unthinkable one day, is not necessarily impossible the next day. So, for example, the fact of being locked down without possible contact with anybody, um, it was science fiction, no? And it became real. So, the lesson I take away from this is that we have to get out of our insensitivities um, what seems impossible one day deserves to be explored. And maybe this can make us optimistic in the current context of ecological crisis in particular. We can dream other options or the past. Um, there is no evidence or a single way to build the future. Um, another aspect that concerns this time my organization that we've learned at uh, Become Tech. Become Tech is an NGO. Uh, its main mission is to open up possibilities to teenage girls to explore computer science, um, is that we became more conscious of our strength, our agility, our ability to react. Um, we are stronger than we thought and we adapted our action to the new difficulties encountered by the girls we are working, working with. We have uh, digitalize uh, in a very short time our awareness programs in uh, in school, and this is a hope. Uh, we are st women are stronger than they, than they think, and they will have a, a lot of to do uh, in the future. So we can uh, get uh, this basis as a a big uh, a big step to begin to begin. Of course, women are stronger than they think. Uh, you so it is so true, uh, Trudy. Will you learn, share your experience with us? Um, first of all, I would advise all women to make use of their female emotional intelligence. Don't um, look at the guys, just bringing the softer skills because that is really important in a all around uh, solution for the next steps. And the other ones is I really hope that all young girls speak up 
No one can mind read. So speak up and say what your ideas are and say what your ambitions is. And those are the two important insights I would like to give you. Evelina. Yes, thank you so much. And also really nice to, to be here. And thank you so much for that. And what I've learned mostly the last couple of months is that um, just your sort of long term planning and taking things for granted, um, it just doesn't exist anymore. And uh, how to overcome that is really to be very pragmatic in all your collaborations and also try really to understand the, the processes for the other parties or to say if it's a collaboration or a customer or an investor, for instance. And uh, I hope that uh, it's a bit more human now than it was before. And I really like that. And Fatumata, what do you think? Yeah, so hello. So what I've learned, I mean, since I've been, I'm working in the space sector, I knew that it was very, I mean, this sector is very important in our daily life. But I think that we, I think that with the pandemic, we have seen that we rely a lot on that. The Wi-Fi, telecommunications, the JPS, and we are still lacking of women in this sector. And I was like, okay, for this pandemic, we really need to do a lot of work to go to get to have more women working in that sector. And that in their ideas, I'm sure that they will take into consideration what it is to be a woman in the daily life. So this is the main thing I have is like, yeah, the space sector is one of the most important, I think, nowadays. Thank yes, you. of course. And uh, uh, can we, um, how can we imagine this inclusive future? Which key, which solution would you suggest? Maybe in your field, Dorothy. Well, um, <laughs> there are several ways of thinking about uh, keys of and course. maybe um, one, one thing that is really important in, for me and for our, my organization um, is to, to well, we know that uh, the next few years, uh, the thing will be really difficult for uh, young people. And one of the, the key um, way to, to face these difficulties for me is that we will have, uh, we will give, we will have more, more room, more space in the decision making process for young leaders. I think that leadership starts with really small step. It is the possibility to choose for oneself from where we are. And in the pandemic, the sensitivity uh, is an opportunity to, to give young people the power to choose for themselves. For instance, um, for instance, in, in, the, in the university, uh, for, um, their schooling has been turned upside down. Um, the universities must reinvent themselves to create distant learning programs. Uh, the students must be able to define what is best for them to facilitate their learning. No? They must be the decision makers in creating the new learning modalities. They, they can, the modalities, they cannot be the same for everyone and everyone has different needs for learning and building its own future. So one of my recommendations would be empowering the younger generation so that they can take their part in creating this more inclusive world from where they are. Elizabeth, which key would you suggest? The key that I suggest is, is catalyzing experience across generations. Uh, I work with a lot of older women entrepreneurs around the world, and they are starting businesses from micro to macro businesses. And if we bring them together with younger entrepreneurs in innovation centers across the world, again, it helps the younger entrepreneurs translate their social media skills, technology skills into shaping a business in the same way that the older women entrepreneurs can bring their life and work experience into the innovation center to create new businesses, to create new startups to really think about your life and your work in a much more entrepreneurial sense. Entrepreneurship is a mindset. It's, it's not just starting a business, it's how you approach your life. And I think, again, we need to stop isolating or putting people in silos so that we have young people and old people 
But once we can get this intergenerational combination, uh, we move ahead much more uh, swiftly and, and much more sustainably. But is it uh, possible in uh, all companies uh, to um, um, build this system? Um, uh, youth leaders uh, who work with uh, more experienced leaders? Absolutely. We've done that in many different uh, private sector companies, and we do it within governments also in terms of building. It's a, it's a mentorship, but it's also a reverse mentorship in that, again, it's the shared skills that each can bring to the table. So you really expand on your problem-solving capabilities. You bring a problem to the table and you bring the experience of the young person and the experience of the older woman. And, and again, it it's really facilitates problem solvings across whatever problem or issue you need to solve. And we do this with people at the very bottom of the period pyramid worldwide, as well as people at the top of the pyramid. It's just amazing when you put your minds together, what's going to work. And what do you think uh, about this idea, Fatumata? Maybe you can react. You are a youth, young leader in your field. Yeah, I would say that the question in science is it's different in the sense that some scientific studies have been done to understand why we don't have so many women uh, doing sciences. And it has been shown that at four years old, in fact, a girl will be teach that science is not for her. Mm. and that she has to take care of the others. So that's why even in, in STEM at a university level, you will see many uh, women in chemistry and biology. And why? It's because in these sciences, there's the notion of taking care of, of other people. And even if there are many women in these fields, you won't have many women at permanent position, at high level position. So what I think for the STEM sector is that, I mean, for the, uh, I mean, for my sector is that we need to be close to the girls from a young age and to be with her during their whole career. Because even at 30 years old, if they have kids, we know that it will have an impact on their career. And even at 40 years old, we have to be sure that they will be recognized for, for the work they have, they have done. I mean, for me, we should not focus on only the youth, mm -hmm. but on all the ages, because we have steps in our professional career as a woman. And women do, do understand why. Because for now, when a woman has a baby uh, right after doing a PhD, it's like mm -hmm. she's she has killed most of her chances to get a position at the university. Uh, it's a very good point you have just raised. And uh, I would like to Elizabeth to um, to, to react, because um, I remember that you said when we prepared this discussion that the main important thing for you uh, would be to rethink our social environment and, uh, and maybe uh, to um, uh, revise uh, child care. Yes, it's uh, when I, uh, we did a recent report at Chatham House on uh, actually it's all about building back better and how can we create a more inclusive economy and the way to do that one of the the primary thing which someone had also mentioned this morning is that women have to have a role in the decision making process mm. but when you get to strategical tactical steps the number one step that has to change is access to quality child care quality child care at an affordable rate. And what governments need to understand is that in child care is not a charitable contribution to women. Child care is actually an economic investment. And if you invest in affordable child care for women, you not only boost the number of women that are going to be able to work, but those women who are now working and helping to drive the economy forward are paying taxes. And those taxes are supporting the local governments. The example that, that I spoke of last time was the child care <clears throat> program in Quebec, where uh, they started it 20 years ago and they subsidized, the government subsidized the child care program. And they have found not only does it now pay for itself with all the women now working, but the taxes that they collect, but it even makes a profit 
so that they can have extended that program throughout Canada. So we have to stop thinking of childcare as some kind of charity for women. It's an investment in women, which are, of course, a huge untapped resource. Uh, we are going to uh, continue uh, our debate uh, about this specific point, but we have a, a question from one of our connected viewers from uh, Kristen Tully, I think. What are some ways to encourage your leadership to implement a more cross-generational innovation team within your own company, office or team? Thank you very much for these questions. I think it is a, a, another question for Elizabeth and then <laughs> Maybe Trudy could uh, uh, answer. No, it's, it's, um, <laughs> we go into corporations, and, and thank you for that question. And it has to be uh, a problem-solving meeting. If you cannot just hold a coffee meeting or a roundtable meeting in a corporation and say, let's bring generations together and make something good happen. You have to create a meeting with a purpose and bring people to the table to solve a problem, bring people of all generations to that table to solve a specific problem so that you can tap in to their experience and their knowledge to solve that problem. Again, it's something that has to be driven. It has to be solution driven. It just cannot be a nice thing to bring generations together. And, and you also have to bring out the data points. And the data points are that in multi-generational corporations, corporations that support intergenerational work, their profitability goes up 20% at a minimum. And this is a data point. This is not some fictional thing that Elizabeth just made up. There's lots of data out there to support that. Trudy, what could you suggest? Well, actually, my experience, so I totally agree with the, the points Elizabeth said. And she also mentioned another point before, which, re, which is really helpful, and that is entering into a reversed mentorship program. So combining uh, people with power, with people from other generations of other viewpoints, that is really helpful and successful as well as an add-on to the young professional boards or a mix of boards next to the CEO level. Evelina, what could you suggest from your own experience to answer this question? Yes, thank you so much. And um, just to give a bit background, I lead a team with 40 experts within pharmaceutical development, cell and gene therapy, and they are spread out on six uh, countries and they range from 17 to 75. And I think it's just in this like sort of knowledge intense, it's more like a development project growing than an organization. And I think in life science, this is what we see um, happening um, more and more frequently. And also that one share resources and it's only based on expertise. You want the people that have done their 10,000 hours uh, in a very specific field to work for you to solve specific problems along the way. And we normally sh share and refer experts between the projects. And um, I think that just like the knowledge and the delivery becomes much, much more important. And who is doing it and the age, mm. uh, culture, anything, it, it's um, of less importance. And then one thing we noticed also when you have this sort of high speed, high energy, very integrated team, there is just no room for, for slack or like that you miss the delivery or that you refer to the wrong guideline and, and just like. And I think the whole group is noticing that uh, very quickly, more quickly now than than maybe before the pandemic. And I hope that all these things um, will actually allow for that more focuses on the expertise and what you deliver and the function and not the, the person. And I hope that that will solve um, and and be sort of inbuilt in reducing focus on who is delivering it. Yes, we have um, another question, very interesting question from Cheryl Miller van Dijk. With the increased burden that the pandemic has put on women, how can we also find bandwidth to not only build back better, but simply 
to not lose precious ground on equality that we have gained in the past decades? Very good question. Thank you, Chairman Mila Van Dijk. Dorothe, maybe you can answer. I know you have very good ideas. <laughs> uh, maybe you can put your microphone on. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, yes, I'm really concerned. I think it's a, it's a, it's really challenging. So um, concerning girls and STEM, for instance, if we take uh, this subject, um, we know that in time of crisis, uh, risk aversion is greater. Uh, and we know that moving towards STEM, where girls are in minority, is often considered by families and the educational community as risky. And I agree that in this context, it is particularly important to support girls' ambition to enter STEM profession and position of responsibility. Um, my recommendation is first, uh, as uh, Fatoumata Kembe said, uh, the challenges are very, uh, where the girls are very young. Uh, they need to discover uh, these STEM professions, the digital profession, uh, they need to be um, convinced that they have uh, their place in these environments. Uh, more than that, they need to experiment with their ability to acquire computer science and to take pleasure, to have fun doing it. Um, also, um, there is a need to, to a global change in mentalities. The responsibility is not on girls, it's global. And when we think that we can lose what the, the progress is of equality, I think uh, the participant is, is really right. Um, the environment in which uh, the, the girls and then the women are in minority uh, should change to be not uh, hostile to them anymore. Uh, they do not have to suffer discrimination or harassments. If they still do, they will continue to be a, an extreme minority of the bravest or the maybe the the the, the craziest to, mm -hmm. to go to these places now. And finally, maybe to 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 get back to uh, the international uh, topic, I think that to build powerful network of international international ah, sorry people <laughs> and um, and also of uh, sorority and so solidarity is really impactful. Uh, this is what we do at Become Text with the support of a community of digital ambassadresses who help each other share experiences, skills, opportunities, and that can make the difference. Elizabeth, uh, what could you um, suggest to those women who are afraid to lose what they already gain? I think, um, as we said early on, they have to be extraordinarily courageous mm -hmm. and they have to find other ways in which to keep their skills and to keep their network up when they can only do it virtually. They cannot, uh, uh, the, in New York City alone, in America actually, the, the number of women who have lost their jobs because of the pandemic mm -hmm. is three times as many as men have lost their jobs. And women, it's, I don't know why it's always been that we have to work harder, but they have to work harder. And they have to take all of those skills that they used in an office and use them virtually to continually reach out to their networks. And, and if you're working in an office, you really have to make a concerted effort to reach out to the leaders in your office to get continual feedback is in terms of, is this what is needed to make the change happen? And what else can I do to help this corporation move forward through the pandemic? It's grossly unfair, but we've done it. Mm -hmm. I've done it now for 70 plus years and you just cannot give up at this point. It's horrendously, mm -hmm depressing at times, yeah. but you also have to flip it around and say the opportunity is there. If I apply my entrepreneurial mindset to this, 
how can I keep moving forward? But it, it, and it's not just incumbent on the women. The corporations themselves need to extend this outreach. They need to provide different kind of training. That is, the worst thing is that women, when they're now left out of the office, are losing all those skills where you get in the office and you're adapting every day and you have everybody presenting new educational programs and learning. Uh, and you, it, the companies need to reach out with more of that to keep women connected so that when the jobs do open again, their skill sets are up to par with what that job is going to demand. Yeah. Do you agree, Evelina? I agree, and thank you so much. I, I really think you said something about um, you have to have the mindset to flip it around and see the opportunities. And uh, I mean, sometimes when you're especially very busy, it's hard to do that because you're just like focused on. But um, there are most of times many more alternatives that one has to choose than what one thinks of uh, maybe initially. I have a, yes, <laughs> I have a, another question uh, for all our speakers. Uh, we understand that it, is, it takes a lot of courage to be uh, a woman. And um, what would you answer to uh, a woman who would be afraid to um, take up, of taking up a challenge in a company dominated by men? Maybe Fatimata can share her experience. Yeah, uh, so the thing is that in my case, I would say that I still try uh, to do some things, mm. but that, because in fact, I, I want to have a feeling that I tried, I did my best. It worked or, or not, but I did, uh, at least I tried. And you know, you know with, with this pandemic, I was like, if I had to die, at least, I will have gained this PhD in astronomy. I went to the US to work with some people working at NASA. So I was like, just do your best and let's see what happened. And you can be proud of uh, what you already did. Thank you. Dorothy. Yes, I would do, uh, I would say the same, go for it. There's nothing to lose to follow your patience. I remember um, uh, one sentence that you pronounce when we prepare the discussion, Dorothy. Uh, you said uh, female leaders uh, have to be leaders where they are. Yes, yes, exactly. I think um, there is a strong need to to get people uh, to be choosing what they want, where they are. As I said before, in university, in your family, wherever you are, um, leadership is something that you build a path from a path and uh, it's, this is really important for me uh, if I would say something to to be all conscious that we must, uh, we must involve the young uh, to create this uh, more inclusive world and give them the opportunity to build the, the future they want. What do you think Trudy? Well perhaps I have another strange advice but for the younger women but Women's leadership is also about choosing the right partner who you want to share your life with and make sure that you don't have to double bind and that you do everything at home and make mm -hmm. sure if you want kids, I mean, you don't know and if you are given to actually have kids, make sure that you have the conversation before like, okay, how are we going to do it? And if you have ambitions, you should really speak up to your husband or girlfriend as well. And, and speak up to the men in the company as well. Nobody can read your own mind. So you have to express your ambition and your needs. That means that you, we have to associate uh, men uh, to this uh, inclusive progress. Yes, and don't say, I don't want to get a higher position because I am a woman. Mm -hmm. Just go for it and jump in every and take every chance you get. Elizabeth. I would say um, I agree with what everyone has said thus far, but I would also add that women need to stop asking permission. 
Mm. Uh, whether you're a girl or whether you're a woman in business and have a place at the decision-making table, have the confidence and trust in your expertise and stop asking permission to present an idea. Present an idea, back it up with data and get people to listen to that idea. You don't have to apologize for being there. Uh, they should be welcoming you to that table. And until they do, you have to stop asking their permission. You have every right to be there. I like that too, <laughs> Evelina. <laughs> Angelus. <laughs> you like Evelina, <laughs> you want to add something? No, thank you. I th I really think like don't ask permissions and also be like very prepared, build the data, build the arguments, and then it's really hard for, make it hard for someone to challenge you by being very prepared. And that's also what I think is like not making excuses. Um. And maybe uh, a word of uh, conclusion from Dorothée, because uh, um, like Fatumata, you're very young and very ambitious and you have a, a lot of energy and uh, it is important uh, to share this energy with uh, our female uh, and uh, male viewers. Oh, your microphone. Ah, again, <laughs> um, maybe, maybe something I could share uh, about the choices you make. Um, when you are young, you have the impression that one choice will define your life forever. And this is not the way it works. Uh, there are progressive choices and you can go back, you can change. And so um, don't be paralyzed by choices that can appear to you like definitive, they are not. There's just one pass and then there will be another. And yes, you are allowed to make mistakes. Thank you very much. Uh, we have learned uh, a lot of things today. Thank you for your intelligence, for your strength. And uh, it's back to you, Ella. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marie-Aline. Thank you to all the wonderful speakers. Thank you to Isabel and Angeles. Um, that was a, a wonderful discussion. And uh, I'm sure all of, our, all of our listeners around the world are feeling uh, inspired and empowered by what you've said. So um, thank you for joining everyone. And to join the next set of sessions, just go back to the live Pay the Women's Forum website and we will see you later today. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>